talking about uh, revocable trust. So uh, Ethan asked me to come down here and give a presentation on understanding trust in the state generally. So I have this presentation, but we can open it up to the floor if there's specific issues that you guys would like me to address. Uh, we've got a whiteboard here so we can um, talk about uh, So my legal practice, I do estate planning. That means I draft the legal documents that comprise an estate plan, which is principally a revocable living and trust. And then we do all the other uh, ancillary documents for the will, zero power of attorney, advanced health care directive, guardian nominations, and then the, the transfer fees for the, the real properties from the building to the ground. Uh, I also do post death administration, so that's going to either be a probate or a trust administration, depending on how legal title was held prior to uh, an individual death. So, if you want a copy of these slides, you can just uh, a QR code, enter your email address, and I'll email you uh, a copy. Just a second. And then this uh, the QR code, I think, is on every slide. Yeah, I, I noticed a lot of people taking pictures of slides. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so let me get, so if you scan it, it'll take you to a page where you just enter your email address and then uh, I'll shoot you an email. Okay, so, so you're, so, okay, all right. So, but who's providing the link for these two things? Nobody. Maybe what are we talking about? So, is this after that? Oh, so today we're just talking about living trust. So that's the topic of today's conversation. Uh, but if you want just education, just education. Yeah. So if you want probate, you, you're going to. No, I have a, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're gonna, okay. 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 All right. So today we're going to be talking about living trust, just kind of the nuts and bolts of what it is, how it works, why people want them, uh, and then we're going to look at two case studies to see, you know, how in a typical situation it would it would help out. Uh, the client, and then again, open it up for Q and A. Jump in at any point um, if you've got a question. Okay, so let's talk about uh, terminology. The first, the first thing we're going to talk about is who creates the trust. The person who creates the trust, they're called the settler. That's the, the legal terminology that gets used in the probate code. It gets used uh, across a bunch of different other legal uh, source materials. But you can also refer to the person who creates the trust as the grantor, um, as the trust maker. Uh, so those are, are words, or trustor, those are words that you might see, but uh, settler, grantor, trust maker, trustor, that all means the person who is creating the trust. So if I have a piece of real property, I'm the person making the trust. Then the next individual we want to talk about is the trustee. The trustee is the person who is going to get legal title. So legal title is the formal record of ownership. So when you buy a house, the, the vesting goes to the buyer. Buyer takes the legal title. So, uh, Robert, if I hold legal title in my individual name, it's going to say, you know, hereby grants you Robert a married man. When I make a trust, I'm going to transfer legal title to the trustee. So the trustee holds legal title. But if it doesn't become the trustee's property, it's still my property. The trustee just has legal title. So that's how a trust works. It's an, an agreement between the settler and the trustee where the trustee is going to take legal title to some property. And when I say property, I don't just mean real property. I mean stocks and bonds, money, cash, all of that is property um, for our purposes here today. <clears throat> so the trustee takes legal title and manages the property for the benefit of a beneficiary. Now, who's the beneficiary? In a revocable living trust context, which is the, the plain vanilla trust that everybody talks about when they say, I've got a trust. The beneficiary is the person who made the trust. So 
I am a robber, I set up a trust, I am the seller. If it's a revocable living trust, most likely I will be the trustee. So I will take title, Robert, comma, as trustee of the Robert Trust, and I will hold and manage that property for the benefit of Robert, the beneficiary. So in a revocable living trust, you wear all three hats. You're the settler, you're the trustee, and you are the, uh, the beneficiary. Any questions about that? Where do the children come in? When someone dies. So, so I, during my lifetime, this is a revocable living trust I've set it up during my lifetime. It's revocable. I hold the power of revocation, which means I can amend it. I can pick who I want to be the ultimate uh, distributee, the person who's going to get all the property on my death. And I can change that as many times as I want throughout the course of my life. But when I pass away, uh, it becomes irrevocable. And now for the law, whatever the final document, whatever my final wishes were as reflected in that, that last legal instrument uh, is gonna be set in stone and the successor trustee is gonna put that into place. We'll talk about the successor trustee in a minute. Um, but before we go there, I want to just point out that there are a class of trust that are immediately irrevocable. And so those you need to be aware of because some people they talk about them, and a lot of uh, people who are just getting into this and trying to figure out what they want, you know, ask the question like, should I get a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust? The answer almost always is you want a revocable trust. Uh, if we're just sort of talking about that foundational estate planning document, it's the same as a will, with the difference being that a revocable trust keeps you out of probate. Um, an irrevocable trust has a specific Purpose. It's a much narrower purpose than a just general purpose revocable living trust. Uh, the most common example would be like a special needs trust. So, for example, if you have a person who is a recipient of government benefits like Social Security income as opposed to Social Security disability or uh, Medi Cal, depending on the situation, then there's a whole slew of other government programs that are net worth based. And so the purpose of a special needs trust is to maintain that disabled person's eligibility for those government programs while also giving them the benefits of, let's say, their inheritance. So you take someone who has a wealthy family member who dies, but they themselves have disabilities and they need those government programs. Uh, and they would rather, you know, maintain their eligibility to those government programs and have, you know, let's say $250,000 in the bank because those government programs are really valuable. They would have a custodian, right? It's not a custodian, it's a trustee. Okay. So the money, so it goes, it's in a separate irrevocable trust that the, the disabled person, the beneficiary does not control. Wow. So we have a third party trustee, either a professional or just a family member who is controlling the money and using it to provide benefits to the disabled person over and above mm -hmm. those government mm -hmm. benefits are. Um, you said something, that I just want to confirm. You said revocable trusts are the most beneficial in the grand scheme of things for people because they keep you out of probate upon the death of the yeah. trustor. Yeah, so uh, most beneficial, I think, I don't know if I would use that, that characterization. I would say it's it's the foundational, it's the most common document. Most common, most common. If you've got real estate and if you have minor children, the revocable living trust is going to be the base of your estate plan. And then if you have additional estate planning needs or wishes. Okay. And then that's where you might get into something more complex like a special needs trust or uh, an asset protection trust in the city or a doctor. And you're doing a ton of surgeries and you're getting sued all the time for malpractice, then you probably would talk to somebody about setting up some legal structures to provide additional asset protection to you. Okay. Additional needs. Yeah, extra, extra, extra wishes, more complex. Uh, but everybody, you know, so from, you know, people that do DIY, like LegalZoom, to people that go to the mega law firms, Beverly Hills and Century City, everybody has that baseline same plan. It's a revocable trust and the complexity and the length is gonna vary, but the, the purpose is the same, just to keep the estate out of probate. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay, I wanna make one more comment um, before we kind of move on a little bit, look at exactly how it is the revocable trust works more detail is the estate tax. So a lot of people have this understanding that there's the death tax, the estate tax, that when you die, part of your 
net worth is going to go straight to the government uh, to pay off some debt. And that is not the case for the vast majority of Americans. The current state tax level kicks in for a married couple at about 26 million. Uh, and for an individual, it's 13 million. So unless you have substantial wealth, you just aren't going to be hit by the state tax. Now, those rates I just mentioned expire at the end of 2025. So Congress, if they do nothing, it'll get cut in half of 13, give or take, for uh, a married couple and uh, six and a half for an individual. But we'll see where that, where that goes. There's been no better time uh, for a state tax. The state tax situation has never been better. Uh, there's a bunch of rules that make it kind of hard to screw up that allow people to not do anything and still sort of get the, the full benefit of the law. And that wasn't always the case. So you'll see a lot of times with someone who did their initial estate planning 25, 30 years ago, is there was a complex subtrust structure. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but we call it like an AB trust or an ABC. And everybody got this, no matter what their, their net worth was, if they had a piece of real estate. That's what they got. And a lot of estate plan attorneys now, when you go back and review that plan 20 years later, at least we get rid of that. We simplify it because there's no need from an estate tax perspective. And from an income tax perspective, uh, there is substantial benefit to ditching that complex subtrust structure. But so that's that's all I'm going to say uh, for the rest of today on the relevance of trust. So let's check. Yes. There's the only time the beneficiaries get to be taxed is when they sell the estate. Correct. So, okay, so the way it works is you're talking on a step up in basis. If I, I die, I leave my stuff to my kids. Mm -hmm. Their tax basis is going to reset to the fair market value on my date of death. So if the house, if I pay $100,000 for the house and it's a million when I die, if I sold it the day before I died, there'd be a 900000 gain, right? If my kids sell it the day after I die, there's no taxable gain because their tax basis is the, uh, the fair market value on my data. If they wait 10 years and it goes up to 1.5, well, now it's, it's 1.5 minus 1, so they have a 500,000 dollar gain. They would have to pay capital gains tax. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's only within two years? No, so that's a separate rule. So I think you're referring to the, the exclusion of capital gains on a principal residence that's been living in a house for two of the preceding five years. You can exclude up to $250,000 per person. Yeah. Right. But so you're, so that, that would only come into play if they move, if they live, they typically live in the house. Okay. Is any of that be in, in your slides? What I just said, no. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, so that's a tax rule. Yeah, so uh, okay, you guys are real estate agents, right? Yeah. So one of your big risk management factors is I am not an attorney, I cannot give you the right, right, yeah. So that's the that's or that's tax, tax advice. advice. So don't so yes, the, yes. you know, I think you should talk to a tax professional about right. that. Right. Okay. Um, because the tax rules are complex and that's just your role as an agent is to be the point person. And so mm -hmm. if you get a couple of good CPAs in different areas of town, don't try to be a, a, right. be a, a tax attorney. Yeah. Um, I don't even try to be a tax attorney. As soon as we get tax, I say, what? That'll do that. Right. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the trust funding process. We touched on it briefly. I mentioned that we want to move legal title from the settler to the trustee. So here, uh, this box, the Robert Trust, that's going to be the trustee, the trust, same thing. Uh, so this is all my stuff. I've got bank accounts, brokerage accounts, life insurance, real property, I've got the LLC, and a retirement account. After I set up the trust, some of this stuff is going to come over. The bank accounts, this one is, is personal preference, uh, but it's good practice to have a bank account that's owned by the trust. It's just one less thing to do post that. The brokerage accounts, those should probably come over. Um, the real property, 100%, that needs to move to the trust. The reason I said bank account and brokerage account probably or should is because we can use beneficiary designations to move those over. So it's, it's either or. Either we're moving it, legal title to the trust, or we're using a beneficiary designation. We have to do one. If we don't, that piece of property 
whether it's a brokerage account or, or whatever, is going to go to probate, which means our estate plan is partially available. So we're okay with everything that's left in Robert going into probate. We're fine with that. No, no, no. We don't want that. Oh, we're, using, okay. we're using beneficiary designations. I see. I see. Yeah. So uh, either directly to so everyone is kind of has different preferences, but but um, the sort of easiest way to think about it is just everything ends up in the trust. And so either we're going to put legal title immediately, mm -hmm. like for real property, or because we've got our auto pays and our checks and we don't want a new bank account for our, our household operating, mm -hmm. we're going to just set up a beneficiary designation to send it to the trust uh, office. Okay. And then retirement accounts, there's no star there. Retirement accounts for most people, well, for everyone, they have to stay in your individual name. You cannot transfer ownership of a 401k, of an IRA, of a 403b, of a pension, of anything to a trust. Um, the plan, the account holder within whatever the plan is, has to be in person. Then the next question is, well, should we do a beneficiary designation? And for most people, the answer is no, because the, the children, so particularly when you have children, get much better tax treatment. Uh, you inherit, so I, dad has a 401k, passes away, has three kids, and the mom's already increased. So, Kids are each one third beneficiaries. They're going to get what's called an inherited IRA. So dad got a 401k. Those assets get divided into three, and now we have three inherited IRAs for the children. The kids can keep the money in that inherited IRA, which is a tax advantage account, no capital gains, for 10 years. They can liquidate it all at once, they can liquidate it all at the end, or they can spread it out, but they get 10 years. Whereas the trust can only keep it for five. But in practical reality, nobody is going to want to keep the trust administration open for five years. So it's probably going to be liquidated on day one. Um, up on day one. Well, it's, it would be all pulled out, and then you have this big fat income to grab whenever you pull it and withdraw from a retirement account. That's, that's 1099 income. Mm -hmm. It has to be just going to be taxed just like any other income. And so oh, the value okay. passed through the beneficiary. So if you have if you have someone who, you know, depending on where your bracket is, if you dump it out all on year one, you might pay more in tax, whereas if you spread it out over 10 years, you can pay at a lower marginal rate, and you also get the, the benefit of the income or the appreciation tax rate because it's in the, the inherited uh, IRA. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought yeah, you were so talking the, about the trust. Yeah, so for most, just the, the takeaways, most people, the retirement accounts stay outside of the trust. The only the only exception would be if you have like a, a really financially irresponsible child and a really uh, retirement account where you wouldn't you know want to say okay you can get you know whatever two million dollars uh, you have full control over. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about LLCs because I know you guys probably see a little bit of this if you have. Uh, if you have clients that are investors. And so this is kind of like a typical setup for someone that has a couple of investment properties. And so you have, this is the, the person, they've got their revocable trust, and then they have their income properties. And now I've set it up with two LLCs, one for each property. This is, this is a risk decision. This is not a legal decision. Um, a lot of people like having LLCs for some reason. They think it's cool to have like 20 LLCs. And so there'll be one LLC per property. And there is you know, a benefit in the sense that if you do it properly, the LLCs, there's no cross-contamination on the liability side, but there's also you know, tax returns, tax returns, tax returns mm -hmm. on the line, so it, it adds it. Uh, and so when I say it's a risk decision, if we're gonna spend you know, whatever it ends up being, 2,500, $3,500, $4,000 a year on accounting and tax for each LLC, you know, if we add those up, we can just, push that to uh, an insurance policy to cover personal assets. And then, you know, but, but it's up to people to decide. So um, everyone can approach that issue however they like. But this is the basic setup is that the LLC would own the property and then the trust owns, uh, is the member of the LLC. Okay, so I mentioned uh, a couple times now that the living trust, the main benefit of the living trust is to avoid probate. So how does it do that? 
The trustee holds legal title. So probate is required to transfer legal title from a deceased person to their legal heirs or beneficiaries. Because the trustee holds the legal title, not the seller, not the person who made the trust, there's no need to transfer legal title from a deceased person. So even though me, I'm the initial trustee of my local trust, I will die, the trust says who gets to be the next trustee. It's called the successor trustee. So I'll pick the Y or my fifth or whatever it gets to be. So when I die, the office of trustee remains. The trustee of the trust still owns the property, we just need to name that person. And so the successor trustee will come in and they'll file an affidavit of death of trustee that says Robert's dead. I'm the new trustee. Now I hold the legal title. And now we can transfer that legal property. We can sell it, we can lease it, we can do whatever we want with it. We don't need a probate court to issue an order that transfers the property. So they own like the trust um becomes the trustee and then the No, so the so we have we have three people, right? We have the seller, then we have the trustee. But this is not as, so we say the trustee, but what we really mean is the office of trustee. Like, but think about the president of the United States, right? The president, we always have a president. The president switches every four years, sometimes it's the same guy, that gets reelected, sometimes it's a new person. If the president dies in the middle of uh, his, his or her term, right? Well, that for that, individual, that human being is dead. But our constitution sets up uh, the, vice president. The, the vice president is the acting president. So now they're going to step in and they're going to discharge the duties. And so here, when the when the settler dies, so that means the trustee is dead, the successor trustee steps in to the office of trustee. And so now they're going to discharge the duties of the office of trustee. They're going to take the legal title and they're going to have full power over the properties within the trust estate. And that's why it avoids probate, exactly. because probate dictates who can do what they want with the real property. Probate is the legal proceeding to transfer legal title from a deceased person. So if you die, and so you hold legal title. Right. If the so the so the vesting, right? So let's talk about what the vesting says. If you hold legal title, and we'll say Robert. You know, uh, I'm married. Okay, so if I'm dead, I hold legal title. Now we need probate because Robert, a married man, is deceased. We've got to transfer this to Robert's legal heirs and beneficiaries. When I hold title as the trustee, it will say Robert as trustee I of the Robert Trust. Got it. So now we don't need probate because now we know who holds legal title. Exactly, because the, the Robert Trust holds legal title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so some attorneys they they kind of they'll do it Robert, uh, comma or the acting trustee or Robert or his you know successors in trust, comma. Even though this is just language, even though the trust belongs to you, you die. You're still the acting trustee of that trust. Well, when I'm dead, I'm, I'm not. You're dead. I'm but dead. like before you were dead, the day before you were yeah. dead, you I were was, still the trustee. I was still the trustee. Okay. Then I died. Okay. So then, what? so basically, what, what we're really talking about is, is title companies, yeah, right? Yeah. So the title companies, they're cool. They they feel confident given, you know, California law and law of that if you have a deed that says this, and then you have another file in an affidavit of death of trustee that's so it's an affidavit, it's sworn, like, you know, you just raise your right hand in front of the judge, it's the same thing. With a death certificate, if that's recorded, then they feel confident, given our legal rules, that whoever is listed as the successor trustee holds legal title. And they'll write the title policy and the transaction can go through. <clears throat> Okay, so then uh, let's just kind of summarize the benefits. Uh, we didn't talk about conservatorship, uh, but conservatorship is where you have a living person who no longer has capacity. So I'm alive, but I have late stage dementia. I can't enter into contracts. 
I can't take care of my financial affairs. I need somebody else to do it for me. If you don't have a living trust, so I hold title of Robert and Mary Van, and we need to sell this house, we got to go to court. We have to start a conservatorship proceeding and get a conservator. Going to the IRS. Because I, I thought I inherited stuff from my parents. Yeah. Um, and it was through the IRS, not through. That's why I needed a 12 under 18. So that was. So, the, yes, you're under 18, so is it a custodian yeah. or a guardian? Yeah, I didn't have my mother. So, your mother, yeah, she acted as your guardian. Yeah. So, a guardian, guardian, and conservator, same idea, just minor, old person. Got it. Got it. Old people, yeah, conservators, uh, minor children. Uh, but basically the same, the same deal. And it avoids conservatorship. Conservatorship. Yeah. Con conservatorship. Yeah. Because they just that person just would have a successor trustee. Exactly. So okay. so exactly. So if I if I lose capacity, well now I need a conservator. This is what title looks like. But if title looks like this as trustee of the trust, well all the trust documents that anybody writes say if I lose capacity, the successor trustee can take that. So it's either if I die or I lose capacity, the successor trustee comes and got it. And so then they just file, you know, an affidavit of uh, uh, change of trustee, basically. And then the drawbacks, so living trusts, they typically, they cost more than a will, but it's because they have more benefits, attorneys are charged more for them, um, and they need to be properly funded. So if you just sign a trust and don't do anything, your estate plan will probably not work uh, because we need to we need to change legal title from from here to here. And if we don't do that, we're going to face the, the issues with conservatorship and probate. Will property taxes be affected if you change title? No. Uh, so the there is an exclusion from the change of ownership. If you're moving it into or out of a revocable trust for the benefit of the initial person, the transferor, uh, there's no reassessment. And then post death, you just drop it out the bill to stop taxing issues at that point. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about conservatorship. This is a, uh, a case that I was involved with, and it concerns a, a gentleman named Lewis. In 2020, he was almost eight years old. He lived in uh, Santa Monica alone. He was single, never married, never had kids. He had a um, a pretty good career. So he, he had accumulated substantial assets. He had a will. Him and his attorney drew up a will and he signed. But he didn't have any other estate plan documents. No durable power of attorney. No living trust. Uh, towards the kind of as COVID was picking up, he got. Sick. His dementia got worse and he was having uh, some cardiac issues and he got hospitalized and then transferred to uh, an acute rehab facility where he kind of just stayed in limbo. So that was typically he would only stay in a facility like that for like four or six weeks and then he'd go to assisted living. But because he, he lacked capacity, there was nobody physically uh, in Los Angeles to help with his sister on the East Coast because he just stayed there for months and months and months and months. And finally, his sister was able to get a conservatorship started and to have a professional conservator named for him. And so what ended up happening was over the first two years of this conservatorship, from the day the conservatorship filed, got, got uh, put in place throughout that two-year period of getting basically getting them settled, getting them to go back to the apartment, hiring the appropriate people to take care of the house. We had housekeepers and you know, meal preparers and medical professionals coming in to check on him. Uh, <clears throat> all of that on just the legal side for the first two years ran up about $60,000 in attorney's fees. And so that was attorney's fees. The court appointed him an attorney. His sister was represented by counsel and the professional conservator was represented by counsel. All of those attorney's fees get paid out of his pot of money out of his conservatorship estate. Uh, the professional conservator over the first two years incurred $55,000 worth of fees uh, because she was taking care of it. That was her job, was to make sure that he was taken care of. And so that, for a, uh, an eight-year-old man with late-stage dementia, uh, required quite a bit of work. So Lewis had no control of his 
Uh, he had no control of his life. That was all within the conservator. All of this was publicly available, documented in public documents. Again, as you know, obviously heard the term spiritual conservatorship, all of those documents you can go download to the course website. And this is going to be in place until Lewis passes away. Um, all of that money coming out of his will, out of his, out of his pocket. Pocket money, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, all so all of this, all of these attorneys' fees, it just it all comes out of his pocket. Yeah. So now he doesn't have any kids, uh, it's just his sister. Um, but if he did have kids, you know, this is just feeding into nice. their uh, their ultimate inheritance. And so then the probate, you know, if he was to pass away now, he'd be looking at about fifty thousand dollars in probate uh, cost. The biggest of those would be the attorney fees and the executor fees. And so the alternative is if his attorney had just drawn up a living trust and they had funded it, so he would have had to spend a little more time and a little more money on the front end, he would have saved, you know, this six-figure legal bill. And so that's that's where one of the underappreciated uh, aspects of a living trust uh, from a second dollar and cents value to avoid a conservatorship is huge. They're way more involved than a, than a probate. And because every, there's three attorneys, uh, whereas a probate typically just have one attorney, uh, the fees really kind of skyrocket. Um, so no, funding it appropriately. I believe my grandfather has a living trust yeah. for his home in Los Angeles. Yes. However, he doesn't make like a ton of money. So yeah. funding it for appropriately seems to me like putting real property. Yeah, so funding it, yeah, I don't mean, yeah, when I say funding, I mean legal title in the name of the trust. I see, I see. So, so the trust is now funded with your property. So whatever your you have. Your house is worth $2. If it's in the trust, you're good. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Exactly. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. That, that's a good question. Yeah, so when I say funding, it's not like, oh, we need to be paying $100 a month into the trust. No, just whatever you have needs to go in the trust. I see. No matter how big or how small the pot. Okay, so now let's talk about a, a probate. And so this is just a, a sort of a fictionalized and simplified probate. So John Smith is our deceased person. Uh, we have a single piece of property, 123 Main Street, three kids, and uh, John got divorced from the mother of those children and remarried his name. So stepmother and three kids. Now 123 Main Street, it was, uh, title was held solely by John, the deceased, the deceased person. Title says, you know, here by Grants and John, comma, single man. He got it before he remarried Jane. On the date of death, the balance of the mortgage is 275. During the course of his marriage, he was paying the mortgage with his W-2 wages. Uh, and so the significance of that is when you pay a mortgage with your wages and you're married, you are using community property because your wages are community property to pay the debt. On, in this case, a separate property, right? a piece of separate property. So that raises a commingling issue. Uh, this is very common. I see this all the time. It only matters uh, in a divorce and in a situation which I'm going to describe now. Um, but if we are using community property to pay off a loan on separate property, we are commingling and we're kind of making a mess. Fair market value of this property is a million. The house was acquired prior, prior to the prior to so I see. So it's his separate property. It's John's property that he's using both of their money to pay off. Correct. Yeah. And so now he's that's what that's how he's making the So when he the day he got married before he paid the mortgage with his wages, it was one hundred percent separate property. He starts using his wages to pay the mortgage. He is creating a community property interest that over time is gonna get bigger and bigger. The more no, he didn't. He sh well, he, he, in my example, he has not added her to the title. But if he did add her to the title, then he would be gifting her the property and making an entire property. Oh, I got it, got it. So that would be his problem. But would it, because he's spending the equity, so he would have equity in it? It's, it's an account. It is equity. It's a forensic accounting thing. So on the, the day he gets married, before he has contributed to it, there's, you know, what, whatever the equity is in the property belongs to him. 100% separate property. But now he's using his community property to pay down the mortgage and to make more equity, right? 
So now that additional equity, post-marriage equity, it's not 100% his. It's part of it is community property. Mm -hmm. And so then now we have to pay an account to figure out. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's look at how the fees work. And so what this is here, this is straight from the probate code. This is what's called a statutory. This is the fee that every probate gets. It's the base fee, the vanilla fee, whatever you want to call it, the standard fee. Um, the probate code uses the term ordinary services, which is not a great term because there's a lot of ordinary things that, that don't actually fall within this. Um, for example, the sale of a real property in most circumstances would, would be taxed the additional attorney fees on top of that. But this is how the, the fee schedule works. And there's 4% of the first 100,000, 3% of the next 100,000, 2% of the next 800,000. So that gets us to a million. So easy kind of number to keep in your head, a million dollar probate is going to create a $23,000 return. Is this the same for all the states? This is for California. Oh, this is this, California. This is California. And so then uh, you would go 1% of the next 9 million, 5% of the next 15, and then anything over 25 million, the court will set the fee. So here, 123 Main Street, which is the only piece of property that we're uh, talking about, is worth 1 million. So it's cut off right there. So we're talking about a $23,000 return fee. The executor fee is the same amount. So if we have an executor who's going to take a fee and the attorney is probably going to take the fee, um, we're going to be at $46,000 to move this thing through probate on just that. Now let's look at some other common expenses. So to get us started, it's going to, it's going to cost $500 to file a court petition, the publication. So we've got to publish in the newspaper notice of the probate proceeding. Depending on the newspaper, that's going to be you know, kind of in the ballpark, two fifty to 500 the probate bond. So, if depending on the situation, the bond level may be high or low, um, depending on whether we're selling real property or we're just going to pass it through and distribute it in kind. Here, uh, I put the bond as the full value of the estate because this house is going to get sold and we'll call it 21 in a second. Uh, so, that's going to cost about $5,000 annually. The probate referee fee, this is the appraiser, it's called, it's called the probate referee. He's going to get paid 0.1% uh, of whatever he appraises. So here that's going to be a thousand bucks. And then some filing fees. If we do a petition for preliminary distribution, which we may or may not do, it's going to be 500. The final petition is going to be 500. And so the additional uh, expenses is going to be about 8,000. We talked about ordinary attorney fees. Um, there might be some extraordinary fees. And again, ordinary and extraordinary is not the best words to describe it, that's what the probate code uses, because the sale of the house is going to incur some additional attorney fees. Those are going to get taxed on top hourly. So $3,500, bucks. that's you know, maybe eight to 10 hours of work, but I'm assuming that process went pretty smoothly. Um, all in, we're looking at call it 5,500, which you can see is a little over 5% of the gross value of the estate, which is a kind of already a big number. But don't forget about the mortgage, right? When we subtract out the mortgage, our, our expenses have creeped up closer to 8%. And so that's really um, where probate hurts, is where we have a real property that has a big mortgage on it. So there's not that much equity, but all of the costs are, are tied to the gross value. And so, as a portion of what the, the beneficiaries ultimately receive, the bigger the mortgage, the higher the percentage. Is it, it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. It's expensive. Because it's percentage, something it's per the flat fee. Correct. Right. Now, this is so. It was Richard, this. Attorneys, most attorneys charge this. And the reason <laughs> is pro, one, I, you don't know what, what a probate is going to look like at the end. You don't know how hard it's going to be to actually get your initial petition granted. You don't know how many creditors are going to file claims. You don't, you don't have any idea how annoying the beneficiaries are going to be, what kind of stress they're going to put on your office, how difficult your client's going to be. And so most attorneys say, I'm going to just charge the statutory. And that's going to be that. And that's what I'm charging. Uh, sometimes it'll be a little too much. Sometimes it'll be a little too little. Overall, on average, it'll be just right. 
Um, but attorneys can charge less. There's some attorneys who you know do a, a low flat fee, but then obviously you're going to get a lower level of service um, if you you know most attorneys are going to charge the statutory rate, which is about twenty grand. If someone's going to only charge you five, they're obviously not going to be able to provide the same level of service that the person who's charging you twenty would be able to. Okay, so uh, let's talk about a couple of issues. So the first is who's going to be in charge of this program? Remember, we have the stepmother with three children. The kids, if the property is 100% separate property, then the kids will get two thirds of it and the stepmom will get one third. So they'll be overall together, they'll take more. She'll be the biggest individual beneficiary. Do they want her in charge? She has priority. So if, if they can't come to an agreement, she'll, she'll ultimately prevail unless there's a good reason to not allow her to do that. But if she was uh, convicted of fraud at some point. <clears throat> the interstate distribution. So if there's no will, right? It's called the test between California and everywhere else. The, the probate code just has a default set of rules. And this is what it would be one third to Jane, the stepmom, and two thirds divided equally between the children. But we have that community property commingling issue we talked about. So this, this is the clean outcome. If John has not been paying the mortgage, this is how it goes. But he did pay the mortgage. So we actually got to figure out which. What percentage slice of the equity in the house is community property? Because Jane is entitled to all the community property. So her position is going to be as much as possible as community property to increase her overall share. And the kids are going to argue the opposite. They're going to want to take, take home as much as possible. Either way, because of this, remember we've got over $50,000 in expenses that need to be paid. And we've got a fight here between the beneficiaries. This house is going to get sold. There's, there's probably not a way to get through this probate without selling the house unless Jane or the kids are sitting on enough cash that they would be willing to fund from the probate out of their own pockets and then just make the, the, the numbers line up on the back end. Uh, well, so we, the only way to avoid the sale would be if you if somebody said, okay, you know, I'm going to loan the estate, you know, 70 back. And then I'll probably just get my money back. Okay. But most people, most families don't come up with that kind of cash. Yeah. So those that's an example of why you know a living trust would we talked 50, 50 grand to administrate this probate. Living trust probably 90 percent discount off that. Uh, if there's no fighting, it's obviously done for you know, five grand. Uh, and some people don't even have that thing. I don't think it's not always the best idea. <laughs> People have like uh, great capacity for screwing things up. Um, but uh, if you did have an attorney, it would not be anywhere close to the other guys can solve it. And that's it. So that's that's the end of this uh, my prepared presentation. Do you guys have any questions uh, about anything we talked about or any trust in the state related to? In order to sell the house in probate, you need to go to the court and get like proof of title, right? No. So okay. to sell the house in Croatia, so that guy um, yeah. will explain in the detail. But the basic idea is you have to, one, you've got to start the probate. So if someone dies, you've got to go to the probate court and ask uh, for someone to be appointed as a personal representative. So that's usually the initial probate petition. Mm -hmm. That takes about six weeks to get granted. So if there's like an emergency situation, you can go earlier, but it's really hard. To do that, the only thing uh, or a judge would be inclined to provide authority prior to the decision on that initial petition would be like a foreclosure uh, to protect the estate's equity. Mm -hmm. So you go, you get that initial petition granted. Somebody needs to be named executor or administrator, that's the personal representative. Now they get a legal document called letters. Those letters are their formal legal authority to act on behalf of the estate. So that means for any piece of property, that's titled in the name of the deceased person, the human being who's holding letters has legal authority to transact on that property. So that's what the title company would need. So they would say, okay, you know, it says Robert's name here on the, on the last transfer deed. Over here, we have the executor of Robert's estate. So now this person will write a policy on my house. So we can, we can move forward and transact. And then and they give the letters to the executor. 
Yeah, so letters, so it's 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 just a core document. Um, okay. It's just it's letters to testament entry or letters to administration. Uh, you you sign them, you file them, the clerk stamps them, gives you a certified copy back, and then that's what you would take to the bank. That's what you would provide uh, to the escrow company to record along with the deed mm -hmm. and uh, for any other asset or property. That's what you would do. You would use your letters to, to take it off. So where do the second or the come in at the end? Well, so typically it's paid at the end, but if it's like a super long probate, uh, you can get you can take partial payment and get out the court. Uh, but most of the time, we're talking okay, it's going to be 12 to 18 months. The fee comes in at the end. And so with real properties, that's one issue that. So I, I like I have a few administrations that are kind of just taking forever to end. And the reason is that the only, the only thing in the estate is a piece of real property. And so the, the estate needs cash to, to close. So this is going to come in the form of a loan, which is very for probate loans are very expensive. So, you know, probably origination of that loan is going to cost you like 10 grand. The interest rate is going to be 12%. You know, it's going to be due in 12 months. And so, there, you know, you can get cash, but from a private lender, but it's very expensive. Or then the alternative would be the beneficiaries have to come up with the cash themselves so that the probate can go ahead and put close and all those expenses get paid. Or, or if nobody's willing to do either of those, then the property just needs to be sold. So after the uh, executor gets the letters and like goes through everything, it just acts as a traditional listing because they're kind of not necessarily. So, um, that depends on the type of sale. So there's two kinds of sales in probate. There's a, a notice of proposed action sale, uh -huh. and then there's a court confirmation process. Depending on the situation, it may require a court confirmation, which is a, a much more involved listing. It's probably going to take 90 days from contract to close or longer. Um, but if you have a notice of proposed action, you, the, the attorney has done what needs to be done in order to get there. Uh, you, could, you could run it like a typical listing. And so, and all that is in your probate. Yeah, that's kind of all yeah. Okay, yeah. this is awesome. Yeah. So, so the executor is the one who gets the biggest chunk out of the. Out of no, the not necessarily. So, if it's a million dollar estate, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm the executor. So, I'm going to take my executor. It's a lot of work. It's, you know, a lot of people go into, oh, it's, you know, for family. I'm not going to use my executor fee. And then 18 months later, like, that was horrible. I want the money. But I'm only going to get the executor. So if it's you know I'm I'm the executor of my brother's estate, his kids are going to get, you know they're going to get the rest. They're going to split that million dollar pot, uh, and I'll take my fee. Uh, now sometimes like I just wrapped up two where the, the executor was the only beneficiary. So in that case, they didn't take the fee because that would have been that would be 1099 income to them, and the inheritance is tax free. So they just said, I'd rather not do that for the. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a client. So she inherited property from her parents, and she's the sole trustee. She has a brother, but the brother has disability. I'm going to be selling their property soon. Yeah. And they're going to buy another property yeah. for the brother. Whose name should will that become a Part of the trust. So it depends on what the trust says. Um, but if the brother has, is he like a government program? No. 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 Uh, so it's, well, so then it just, that's really a question. Like she needs to consult with an attorney to determine whether uh, it makes sense to transfer his interest to like a special needs trust. Um, if is he able to? Does he like take care of his own financial affairs and everything? He does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah but if he doesn't, if he doesn't need anybody to take care of him, and he's not eligible for government programs or isn't using them, then that's up to them. But probably they should just each be co-owners. Should it be then advisable to have the brother as part of the trust? That's going to be up to him and exactly what the trust says. If it was me and I was him, I would say no. Give me, give me my property. I don't need, I don't need this big sister as the trustee on, on my half of the property. 
Um, but that's one, one, the trust is going to speak to that, whether it's an outright distribution or a distribution of trust. And two, you know, to what extent the sister is going to be able to control that asset. And so that, you know, she, they, she needs counsel. And if I was him, she was going to try to control the property ongoing, I would, I would put up with that if I was him. So those two kind of are going to need to figure out what their respective rights and responsibilities are. I feel bad for the brother, of course, because the daughter was the only one who on the trust. But as trustee, not so it's there's who's in charge and who gets what. Sounds like she's in charge. She's in charge. But she she has to divide. So it. does it mean that she gets all the? No, it, pro it probably says most likely, unless they mention disinheritance. It probably says you're in charge, split it fifty fifty. That's another document. No, it's just a second. It's a, so there's sections, right? So it'd be like the successor trustee section, and then down below, below that usually will say how the property is divided. Um, she, if she's not sure, she needs a lawyer. Mm -hmm. She needs to talk to a lawyer about what what she's supposed to do. All right. I mean, and, some some people. And the replacement home that they're buying, will that become part of the trust? I don't know. I don't know what the trust is. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. It has to be based on a certain language. It's, yeah, you've got to start with the trust. Yeah, because I was just having a conversation this morning with, <clears throat> with the guy who, um, their property is being in trust and, and probate going on. It just closed. Yeah. But the man that died yeah. left their wife 51% while she was the executive. Yeah. So now that this finally closed, the guy I was speaking with this morning was saying something about she was in charge of the money. And somebody said, well, it's up to her whether she pays this, this guy his money and he's one of the siblings. So just based on what you were just saying, this guy has money coming regardless. She cannot, it's not up to her. It, yeah, so that, I think that's that's one area where people get in trouble is they, they don't get a lawyer involved because it's a it's, Pretty straightforward. If I read a trust, you say, okay, you're in charge, and here's what you got to do. Once you got to get gas, it's called Marshall Real Estate. So get control of everything and then divvy it up. So if it says that she gets 51 and the other people get 49 and the other guy gets 49, he got to get his 49. She can't not give him a 49. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, or else he's going to go to court and get a surcharge. Yeah, yeah, that's what brought up too. He said, well, if she doesn't pay me, then they said, exactly, you have to sue her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah. So the in in the situation you've described, it's your client probably should should talk to an attorney to figure out what what her obligations are. Yes, and um, because when the vesting comes in on the new property, um, I suppose it will be in her name. It would be the trust. It, should, it would be part of the trust. Her, so they sold the original the first property. They will be selling they that be selling. original property right. and getting a smaller replacement property. Yeah. Um, so whose name should be on that? I said, I don't know what the trust is, so I couldn't tell you. Because well, if he's, so if, I'll give you an example. If it says, you know, the trustee shall distribute my estate to my children by right of representation and such distribution would be outright, then she really shouldn't be purchasing anything. She should just be giving her brother half the money. I did see a copy of the trust. Yeah. It only has her name. But um, it doesn't really say on the trust whether the brother gets anything, although the brother... It probably does. does. Yeah, it probably does. It probably does. does. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly. Because she has the, the mental capabilities yeah. to manage the trust. Um, if it looks like an attorney drafted it, yes, then it, it almost certainly does. But if it doesn't, then okay. if it's missing, if it's truly missing that clause, then I don't think the, I think there is because they they do care for each other. So yeah. um, it's just that the brother does have a little bit of a mental yeah. disability, and that's why it was given to the sister. Um, well, when you say so, you I have, mean, as in the trustee. She was named trustee. She was named trustee. And now the parents have died, so now she's making all the decisions. Yeah. 
but I'm thinking of the next step, which is the new home that they're going yeah. to. Be. Yeah, so that's I. My view is you just there's no next step. Is you just distribute the property to the beneficiaries, and if he wants to co-invest and co-own property with his sister, that's his call. Now, maybe that's what it says to do that. I don't know. But if what do you mean? There's no next step. Like, I that she cannot buy property with. Well, she could with her half. That's her money. Okay. Yeah. So the, the administration of the trust is, you know, step one, marshal the estate. Step two, appraise the assets, pay the debts, deal with the accounting and tax. Final step, step three, distribute the estate to the beneficiaries. There's no, oh, let's now go reinvest this into more stuff, and I'm just going to be the trustee over all of it. Um, well, no, you're not too bad. Like, your next house is going to be like, Lisa. No, they don't have to figure that out. Because not she, now. She should just give the money. Like, it, so let's say it's a million bucks. So it's a fill a house. We have a million dollars of proceeds after expenses. She should just write a check to her brother for half a million dollars. Say that's that's your money. That's your inheritance. Here you go. That's sort of like the process I'm going through right yeah. now. Is that the only way that they could move to a smaller house is I might get them enough or find them a replacement property. Does he live with her? He lives in the house. She lives somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think she. I think they both need attorneys. But I don't that, know. They both need attorneys, and this is one, yeah. one situation where you should not. Okay. Should not so be the attorney. Make sure to yeah. give yes. me your contact information. Yeah. So my yeah. So my number's <laughs> on the back. You can ask okay. my call me. I'll tell her. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Because that was what we were trying to figure out, and she thought it was like a simple like, oh, I'll sell this. And I'll buy another property because yeah, I want a, my brother to live there. Yeah, um, she's, she might be creating a problem for herself um, because, right? I mean, if you're if you're withholding a benefit from someone and they're not getting the benefit of that pile of money, they can turn around and say, "Hey, you didn't follow the documents and California law says to." Mm. Uh, and so that a lot of successor trustees get in trouble because they try and they do uh, more. Than they need to, or they, or they try to take on additional responsibilities that don't belong. So before she buys another property, they have to contact a lawyer. I will have to. She doesn't have to, but from what everything you said, I think it would be prudent of her to consult with counsel uh, as to the course of action that she was planning to undertake. Uh -huh. See, yeah. Because <laughs> unfortunately. It's a sticky situation because she plans on using proceeds from the sale of the big house yeah. to pay off her own mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which is not the right thing to do because, and then buy a, like a, a smaller property for the brother. Yeah. I'll have to do Yeah, so I, she yeah. can talk to her. Yeah. I, would, I would be happy to speak to her. Okay, yeah. good. That's why I attended this yeah. class because it was like, okay, it's a little bit too complicated, yeah. but it's like chasing yeah. something we're in. I have to find them first, a replacement property for them to sell this property. And then um, now knowing that it's possible that she may, she cannot do that on her own. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you have one more uh, classes for this right here? Uh, so I, I, so I actually presented that here uh, a while ago. I haven't, I presented it a, quite a few times at the beginning of the year and then kind of over the summer um, backed off a little. Uh, but yeah, no, I put that presentation on. Because it says uh, first edition. Oh yeah, so that's, a, so what I did is um, after, you know, doing my presentation a bunch of times, I wrote up that guy and then put it all in the guy. Okay. So yeah, if you guys if you have clients, buyers, or sellers that would need trust and estate advice, I'd be more than happy to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. All right, well, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. You're welcome.